Okay, so uh, I think people are still joining, uh, but let me get started in the interest of time. I want to welcome everyone to this last Data Science Coast to Coast seminar of this year. My name is Jing Liu. I'm the Managing Director of Michigan Institute for Data Science at the University of Michigan. Together with my colleagues, shown here, you can see on the slides, who are the executive directors of other data science institutes. We have organized this seminar series um, in the hope of using it as a concrete way to foster a broad reaching data science com community that can collaborate routinely to advance our missions for research, training, and data science for social good. So in the first half of 2021, we hosted five seminars, taking advantage, I guess, of the Zoom environment that we are also used to right now. So today is just the last in a series. Each seminar features one faculty member and one postdoctoral fellow from two universities, and they are grouped by themes. The speakers talk about ongoing projects and motivating issues. And we hope this format will lead to follow on research discussion, which will in the long run, foster new collaborations. Today's theme is ocean dynamics. There will be two speakers today. Our first speaker today is uh, Miguel Jimenez Urias who's a postdoctoral fellow of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Johns Hopkins University. His research focuses on the study of the geophysical fluid dynamics as the foundation for understanding basic processes in physical oceanography, focusing on processes that happen in a scale of a few kilometers to a hundred kilometers, combining simulations, analytical models, and high resolution global circulation models. He received his PhD in physical oceanography from the U University of Washington. Our second speaker today is Laura Zana from New York University. I will actually introduce her after Miguel's talk. So now I would like to have Miguel share his screen. Audience members, you can put your questions in Q&A. Um, depending on time, we might save all the questions till the end of both talks. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Miguel, you should go ahead and share yours. Thank you. Um, see if I get this right now. <laughs> um, is that my presentation or? Yes, it looks very good. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> So uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, actually, the, the title is a little different. Uh, there was a little bit of a update on the title a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the original title was sent about several months ago. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so my title is Scale Dependent Shear Dispersion, Steering of Mystic Mixing of Passive Tracers in the Ocean. This is kind of like a funny uh, project because it, uh, it, it was funded by IDS, the Institute of Data Sci uh, Intensive Engineering Science, uh, as a data intensive modeling uh, project. But somewhere early along the way, uh, we kind of got stuck in mathematical solutions. So <laughs> a full disclaimer, there, are, there is no data. <laughs> it's a little bit of a, a little bit of awkward here, but uh, it's all uh, exact mathematical solutions, which is, is kind of exciting. And the exciting part is that it can be expanded upon, which is very promising. And so I'm gonna talk about this kind of like, first of all, kind of talk a little bit about oceanic tracers. Uh, I mean, the emphasis is passive tracers. And the big distinction is that passive tracers do not have a feedback into the momentum uh, of say the Newton's laws of what rules how the water moves in the ocean. So passive tracer are, are more like uh, chlorophyll, nutrients, oxygen contents. They can vary, they can be affected by the fluid, by the ocean currents. So right now in your figure, you're, sh you're seeing um, should have some animation here, but you're seeing um, temperature of the ocean. I think the, 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 the objective of this animation, which maybe it's not working very well, is to show this latitude bands distribution of temperature, even though temperature is not exactly a passive tracer, 
tracers are very useful because they can actually uh, indicate how the currents move in the ocean. So the ocean, um, so first of all, you see a lot of uh, differential heating in the ocean. So the equator is really filled with hot water, then the pulse is really cold water. So you have a pressure gradient, and then you have a balance between that and the rotation of the Earth, essentially making everything, the fluid motion to, to form, there's a tendency from jets, so essentially sonal flows that go from east to west in the northern hemisphere. So that's why you see these latitude bands uh, of temperature. The southern ocean is kind of uh, special because it's uninterrupted by continent, by content, by continent. Meanwhile, where you have continents, uh, you have strong boundary currents that have a tendency for, to form jets as well. So essentially, the big takeoff is just by looking at this tracer, even though it's not the passive one, that I'm trying to show animation. Oh, sorry about that. Um, it's not playing, I apologize about that. It's that you have a tendency to form jets or sonal jets in the atmosphere. Uh, they have like wide scales, uh, but in the ocean, they're like the smaller scales because the density contrast is much, much different. And modeling of ocean tracers, the passive tracers remains an active area of research because they can indicate bi biological activity. They can uh, indicate ventilation zones and mixing of ocean, oceanic water masses, how all oceanic water masses are depending where they sink and how they mix along the way. So it's a really useful tool to study. And again, it's a very active research area. Um, when it comes to modeling, like global climate models are limited by spatial resolution or temporal resolution, mostly because they have to run very long time integrations uh, forward in time, hundreds of years. Uh, and there's a, a problem with numerical instability. You have to kind of respect that. So you have to restrict, first of all, you have computer power limitations, so you have to uh, you have to run them that will actually finish to run and won't take years. But also you have a computer storage storage of data, so it's a big problem trying to resolve all of the scales. So you, there's a compromise between the scales that you can and you want, and usually you neglect a lot of stuff that happened at the subgrids, essentially stuff that lives within the uh, between the margins of resolution. Uh, so, for example, you're seeing here the two uh, pictures of how, kind of what uh, the impact of resolution have on land. You see that the top figure is from both of them from IPCC reports. So you have a high resolution, but those are not most model simulations, climate simulations, global climate simulations do not have that enough of resolution. So you have grid squares of horizontal uh, dimensions about 90 kilometers. So anything below that is not resolved it's, uh, by the model. You're seeing uh, even higher resolution, and those are you really done only for regional climate simulation. So you don't have a full integration of all of the scales. So you need to in include parameterizations of physics or mathematics to determine how things mix in the ocean or how things will have an effect from within a grid, grid box out of the grid box. So that's kind of like where I am. Um, the, one of the things I'm interested in is why use idealized uh, mathematical models and what it really is to answer simple questions and that can give you some insight into the physics and mathematics uh, in this case it's really uh, one of the stuff that i'm interested in the interplay between different scales uh, between the advection uh, which is the transport irreversible irrevers transport and diffusion which is the irreversible mixing uh, the equation of motion is actually well known uh, and we're really interested in, in, in figuring out given initial distribution how the tracer will evolve. And what you're seeing here is actually an observation with surface ocean chlorophyll somewhere in northern uh, and the Baltic seas. And the really striking feature is that the more you zoom in, the more and more and more features you see that are not super smooth, but then all those features of the circulation also are features, fine scale features of surface chlorophyll. Uh, those kind of, this, what you're seeing, the smaller, uh, Grid, uh, the smaller picture is about one kilometer resolution. So that stuff is be, uh, beyond what models can actually resolve. And going back to the mathematics, uh, really um, the simple equation is uh, essential uh, for a tracer. There's no, again, feedback with momentum, with uh, energy uh, constraints. So everything is uh, all of the, the, what determines the physics of the solutions or the mathematics of this is contained with a single parameter, which is the pack to the number, which measures the relative uh, kind of what uh, dominates either reversible emotions or transport of passive tracers or the diff diffusive, which is irreversible. So there's a competition between that and the Peckland number kind of like gives you that. A large Peckland number means that vection or reversible transport dominates. 
I mean, well, a small particular number is mean, essentially means a diffusion dominance. And going that uh, along with those idealizing uh, models is that the, the process of shear dispersion, uh, which was brought up early in the 50s uh, and then kind of been revisited and revisited and revisited. But essentially, this idea that if you have initial concentration and you have no fluid motion, it will take a long time to mix. And it actually will start mixing only at the edges. And it can, you can actually estimate how long it will take. It could potentially take, uh, depending on the, the, the properties of the water, it could take months to actually diffuse. This is the coffee uh, stirrer experiment. But if you have a shear flow, that essentially means that a velocity field that varies spatially, you can accelerate that process by essentially deforming the surface and increasing the surface area where diffusive mixing can happen, essentially increasing the gradients, because uh, that's where diffusion can be accelerated. And that enhanced diffusion is essentially uh, uh, it's due because of the advective transport. And that's the, essentially the phenomenon of shear dispersion, it's interaction between velocity gradients and weak diffusivities. Um, going, up, going back to the 80s, uh, one of the seminal papers about this uh, by Peter Reins, who I actually have a good uh, fortune to get to know him and learn from him a lot. And Bill Young, his student back then, they kind of like divided into two different time scales, what they call the rapid stage, which you can see these little diagrams that will kind of be the rapid stage when you have a lot of deformation of the tracer. And then uh, that takes time, that takes within uh, time scales that are really close to time equals zero. So essentially uh, it will take, given initial condition, the rapid stage with, will be the dominant one uh, initially. And then once it deforms enough, then diffusion the will take over. And that's a slow stage. Uh, essentially you mix, but rather than having the molecular diffusivity, you have an enhanced diffusion diffusivity, which is inversely proportional to the, the background, uh, the kinematic diffusivity. So that's kind of very important because uh, it was one of the seminal papers. Uh, one of the things about this though, is that uh, this kind of like theory uh, was developed for flows that the shear is constant. So you can imagine a linear uh, dependence on the flow velocity. Uh, so everywhere the shear, the gradient of the velocity is constant. So you have this kind of like uniform enhanced diffusivity. Something more complex could be, for example, and there's some insight about this, is these are the cosine jets or like jets that have a Fourier series expression in one, uh, in one component. So you can think of a jet, a cosine jet will be kind of like the simplest case in area where you have regions in which the velocity goes to zero, have them well, has a maximum, the shear is maximum, the shear is zero in particular places. Uh, and it's the simplest, but also the most complicated one because it incorporates a lot of uh, uh, really interesting uh, dynamics there. Uh, the, generalization will, the generalization will be the case when you have a jet in which the, the, the velocity has a Fourier expression, a sum of modes, this being the simplest case. And Peter Ryan and Bill Young actually did look into this, uh, which was very interesting. They arrived to the effective diffusivity, but then the more recent papers by Camasa and 2010, they, they realized that there's two different regimes, one of them of anomalous diffusion, which characterizes long lived tracer that doesn't decay that fast and it gets affected. Uh, and, then, and then there's another time scale in which the diffusion or the effective diffusive effect, uh, which takes place way later. And there's a scale selection there. Uh, they did this kind of like a local analysis, essentially meaning that it's just, uh, they just look at particular regions of the, of, of the, of the flow. Another one that was actually more influential to our work was by Ali Mani and Park. It's actually uh, about to be published, I think. And they, this is how this project started because they derived this uh, numerical algorithm called the microscopic forcing method to essentially run the uh, repeated direct numerical simulations uh, and from that recover the, the, the edit diffusivities. And they tested actually with against the cosine jet and they got some good agreements. So you can see sort of a uh, direct numerical simulation which resolves all of the scales and their method and then they got some really interesting uh, approximate solutions that uh, merge uh, they, they, they have a very good agreement with those and they, they derive some based from that method some inspired operators which is very groundbreaking on their own uh, uh, so this is kind of like what i took so i took that i started from here and that's the solution that alimani showed it was an, they kind of like use an approximate method to solve it uh, it didn't solve the initial condition, but it, so, it essentially solved almost all of the scales. And it also, I was interested in how they agreed with the Kamasa results of this interpretation of time scales. So that's how we started eventually, uh, interesting kind of replicating some results. 
And then at some point, uh, uh, it, it came kind of obvious that apparent that it, it can be solved uh, by hands. And, and it did, uh, we were able to solve it and turn it into an eigenvalue problem. So this is a linear problem. You can actually add solutions, it depends on a single initial condition and you can add and recreate many different cases. Uh, there's uh, one physical one, uh, the solutions depend on one single canonical uh, parameter, which is a cube parameter, which contains all of the physics of the problem. It's a product between the Peckler number, which kind of measures the, the relative strength of diffusion against advection and the wave number of the initial condition, essentially what is the tracer, what does it look like spatially? Uh, and because it's a product of then a single value of Q can result from different combinations of values of those. So that was very interesting. Um, that the case, so this, the, the solutions are actually as an infinite sum of these modes, each of the mode multiplied by an exponential the case in time and the decay rate is given by the frequency, which is proportional to the eigenvalue. So all of the information is contained within this uh, single canonical parameter, which was very interesting. Uh, one of the things that actually arose from the simulation is that the eigenvalue system is non-hermitian, meaning that not all the eigenvalues are real and different. They are all, but uh, so it's not guaranteed, but they are real and different when the values of Q are much more less than one. In fact, it's less than 1.468. Uh, for values before then or smaller than that, all of the eigenvalues are uh, real and different and therefore solutions decay diffusively, pure, a pure diffusion process. But if you start to increase values of Q beyond that value, uh, you start seeing uh, modes that become complex conjugated in their eigenvalue, which means that they counter propagate. So that, is, uh, that was a very interesting result that we found initially. And essentially means that you can construct solutions that behave like waves, but in the sum they describe how the tracer gets advected and diffused by the shear, by, by, by the, the, the effect of the jet. Um, within those frequency, within the eigenvalue, we can sort of estimate how the location of the Peclet number depends on the, uh, so the, the location of the exceptional point depends on the Peclet number. So for example, again, a single value of Q can result from different combinations of value of the weight number of the initial condition and the Peclet number and the exceptional points which mark this transition from diffusive to propagating solutions. Uh, those exceptional, exceptional points happen and fix values in Q meaning that if you increase spectrum number, you can displace the location of the transition regime moving into the left of your screen. So towards smaller values and the wave number. So uh, as you increase the Peclet number, which means the advection dominates, then uh, all of your solutions will behave this propagating. We have this propagating regime, which was very interesting. So with this, then we, could, we were able to get animations of solutions. I hope you're seeing them essentially initial condition and initially has no dependence in Y, but it behaves like a Gaussian in X. So you can recreate solutions like that, construct them. You can change the width. You can change what the cross jet structure looks like too, um, which was very interesting. In this case, the vector number is 2000. So in fact, all of the eigenvalues propagate in this regime. Uh, none of them decay as a pure diffusive uh, uh, process. You can also come up with a change the vector number, which essentially the flow behaves more diffusively. Um, and, and in this case, you have some solutions that do not propagate, so they just decay. But it takes a while, it takes a long time once you, in order to hit the pure diffusion regime. So early, initially, once you run the, the, the solution, you forward it in time the solution, everything that dominates is the advective part, the, the propagating part. And But you can actually be more creative and look at the more complicated initial conditions like a Gaussian localized uh, center image along the channels. Uh, and then you can play of how the vector number affects it. Um, so that, that was really, uh, really nice. As we thought uh, really interesting. Uh, and then essentially we were able to confirm the results from CAMAS essentially that uh, for certain values of the wave number that is way bigger than a, a threshold, you have solutions to propagate. So this is an anomalous regime essentially a vector transport. Uh, the transport, the tracer doesn't decay, it just gets moved really fast along downstream, which is the rapid stage that Peter Ryan and Bill Young talked about. Uh, but because we have the whole space of the solution, we can actually pinpoint the scale at which this transition, this transition happens for a, a given value of the Peclet number, and also a given time scale at which all of the propagating modes decay and die. 
and all of that's left is the diffuse, the pure diffuse regime. And these time scales are uh, as exactly at 1.91 units of diffuse time scale. After that, from the initial application, all of your solutions behave like an, an effective diffusion regime. Before then, you have a lot of propagation. You have this anomalous regime, which was, uh, I, again, it agreed a lot with what Kamasa was talking about in this local analysis that were just in the region where the velocity field had an inflection point. Um, and then inspired by Alimani in their work, we were, uh, I think we thought that the simplest thing to do, which is to look at what the, the closures were, given that we have the solution for the whole regime, any value of Peclet number and, uh, and initial conditions. But at the same time, we can also come up and be more creative what the averaging filters were. What, uh, so for example, in this case, and the, the left figure, you see initial condition that is independent in Y. Uh, so like a dye tracer doesn't vary in the cross jet direction, but in the figure on the right, they have essentially kind of like similar condition, uh, initial conditions, but uh, the, the solution is localized at Y equals pi over two, just a, a double, uh, like a radial Gaussian. So you see that it's only, you see a propagation to the left. So any closure will actually have to figure out how to include all of these uh, behaviors uh, in, a, in a way that it makes sense. Uh, and we were kind of lucky that we were uh, able to, to, to come up with a simple result and the closure actually proportional to the eigenvalue. So all of our insights from the eigenvalues uh, themselves uh, the, and how they depend on Peclet number, you can look at how they uh, become operators in physical space. So for example, again, at long time scales, uh, scales that are much smaller than uh, 1.46 phase divided by the Peclet number, Everything is purely diffusive, and you can recover a closure for the maximum for the eigenfunction uh, that is a kind of like an effective diffusion regime. And the parameter, the effective diffusivity, matches exactly what the theory should, uh, the, from back in the 50s, what they said it, it should be. The other regime, which was the interesting anomalous regime, you also uh, look at those, uh, uh, you can also figure out what the, uh, the closure for that regime is. And essentially, you recover a fraction order operator which is it's a combination of a pure linear advection by the amplitude of the jet. In this case, the cosine has a maximum plus minus one. So essentially you have this kind of like, that's where the cone is in this, in this mean. And then you have a fraction order operator, which essentially dictates that the tracer decays really slowly. If you were to apply for like an diffusion, effective diffusion everywhere equally, you essentially will, will impose that the tracer decays really sharply, as opposed to having long lived anomalous fluxes outside of, out of the subgrid boxes. Um, so with this kind of stuff, we thought about uh, that uh, given a general averaging filter, uh, we can, we have this kind of like two time scale closure that if they incorporate the scale dependency, giving this phenomena that we saw, uh, and therefore we were able to kind of like propose a closure that it's dependent, it's just a time scale separation behavior and within it, given the averaging filter and how you project an initial condition the Matthew functions or the Eigen functions, you can recreate this type of uh, localized uh, initial condition that have a Y structure, which was, which is, we consider is very promising. And just to finish up, I think the summary and one of the things that we were excited about the cosine jet is that it's really the simplest case. The cosine jet is the simplest case in which the jet has a four year structure. So you can come up with something more complicated and in fact, we've been, we've been able to expand our analysis, which is again, there's no data, it's just a mathematical solutions into cases in which the velocity feels localized like a Gaussian, and just a jet, but it's just lo localized rather than having a irrealistic cosine structure. Um, and again, we were able to uh, construct solutions and kind of like recover some of the asymptotics uh, that we were uh, from the previous literature and provide something that might be potentially useful uh, for uh, transport uh, modeling, uh, aside from what uh, the really cool stuff that Manny and Park have done. Uh, and then uh, I just want to end with this idea that, again, we can expand upon this method. And we've kind of been able to do this kind of stuff for several cases of jet flows, and uh, uh, which is very exciting. And one of the things that we're interested in applying into, in terms of oceans, uh, tracer dispersion, and is that effective shear dispersion induced by gravity waves, vertically propagating gravity waves onto the uh, passive tracer field, uh, which I think needs to be re revisited given our analytical solutions. And 
with that, I, I, I say thank you, guys. And I hope I didn't bore you with all of this mathematics. <laughs> Miguel, thanks very much for a very stimulating talk about this complex problem. Um, let's see if you um, if you stop sharing, I will ask Laura to share her slides while I um, introduce her to the audience. So Laura Zana is professor in mathematics and atmosphere ocean science at the Current Institute of Mathematics and the Center for Data Science at New York University. She received her PhD in climate dynamics from Harvard and was a faculty member at Oxford before moving to NYU. She was the recipient of the 2020 uh, Nicholas P. Fafanoff Award from the American Meteorological Society for exceptional creativity in the development and application of new concepts in ocean and climate dynamics. Her research focuses on the influence of the ocean on the climate at both local and global scales. Her recent work includes understanding the role of the ocean dynamics in ocean heat and carbon storage and sea level under climate change and developing physics aware machine learning models. Recently, she received a major grant from Schmidt Futures to lead an inter international research team to use cutting edge machine learning methods to improve climate models and to incorporate many complex processes including ocean ice, atmosphere and so on. So um, I would, okay, so now I would like to pass it on to Lore and let you start your presentation. Great, thank you very much. Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, and so uh, thanks everybody for joining and, and it's great to actually come uh, just after Miguel who already introduced you, uh, you know, to the problem and the complexity of the climate system and and finding what we call parameterization, which is you know, trying to actually capture the you know, many processes that are not resolved in climate models. And this is what I'm gonna show you here today, but rather than you know, starting with some kind of beautiful theory, I'm gonna start from data. And, and, and this is really kind of the way we're going at it, which is how can we blend the physics and data and, and data and machine learning to actually try to represent many processes that we can't resolve in the climate system. And so hopefully I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll show you that there's a lot of work to be done. And again, I already showed you that, you know, there's a lot of theory uh, that goes into it and yet many aspect remains, you know, to be understood. And so the question is, you know, can we use data and physics and theory together to actually make, uh, you know, a step forward uh, that, that can be transformative to some extent. So as always, you know, I'm, I'm the one speaking, but a lot of the work is done, uh, you know, by amazing people, former PhD students on Bolton who uh, now work at GitHub and her current postdoc, Arthur Guillaume, uh, was at NYU and starting a faculty job uh, in September uh, in uh, stats and data science. Okay, so we're gonna take a little bit of a step back and kind of, you know, remember what the ocean is or what do we know about the ocean? Uh, so the ocean is basically covering, you know, 70% of, of the surface of the planet. It's a massive heat reservoir. And here I'm showing ocean heat content, which is basically how much warming we've been seeing over the past 150 years. And so what you see is that, you know, things are getting redder or yellower, meaning that the ocean has been taking up more heat, uh, more energy that we've been putting into the climate system is being absorbed by the ocean. So about 90%, more than 90% of the excess energy that, uh, that is due to anthropogenic climate change actually ends up in the ocean. So understanding how tracers, as Miguel has been talking about, how temperature and carbon are taken up by the ocean is actually pretty critical. And a big component of that is how this heat and carbon are being moved around, how they're being steered and how they're being mixed. And so how do we know that the oceans are going to continue to warm? Well, you know, the more we emit, uh, the more we're going to continue to take up. Uh, but the rate at which we take up heat and carbon is definitely affected by, you know, again, many processes that we do not resolve in climate simulations. So again, Miguel kind of pointed out the fact that, you know, we use climate models and they're, they're amazing. I'm, I'm a big fan of them. I've been using them for a very long time. And here is a simulation. So it's the same climate model but solved on basically a different, uh, on a different same grid, but a grid that has a different horizontal resolution. So we're still looking at ocean temperatures here in this kind of climate simulation, 
And the one on the right has an horizontal resolution that is about one tenth of a degree. So basically a box that is 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer. And as you move towards the left on the screen, here, the horizontal grid is about 25 kilometers by 25 kilometers, so it's getting coarser, right? And you can see things are a little bit more viscous. Uh, you know, the flow is not as nice and, and turbulent and pretty as we see here, because we resolve a lot of important processes. And then if you go again a little bit more towards the left, that's actually kind of a typical resolution of a climate model. One degree by one degree, so 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer grid box. So you can you know, barely see things moving anymore uh, to some extent. So the, as, as you, know, you increase resolution, you actually can represent more physics. You can represent a lot of those steering and mixing processes that are actually critical for the large scale flow. But unfortunately, your computational cost goes up pretty drastically. And we can't afford to routinely run climate simulations for hundreds of years or for ensembles, which is kind of important for us. So usually we compromise. So we run those equations, but on a coarser resolution uh, grid box. And so of course the problem is, how do you represent the physics that is missing at those kind of coarser resolution models without having the computational cost of running at high risk? And that's where you know, the closure problem comes about that Miguel talked about. And for you know, decades, um, you know, climate models have been doing you know, what we know they can, we can do is, okay, can we represent all the processes that are not resolved on that grid? Clouds, for example, in the atmosphere, right? So they're gonna have scale that are much smaller than this kind of 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer grid boxes that we're talking about. Same for ocean turbulence and mixing and steering that Miguel was talking about. So again, we're looking at kind of a satellite image of, of again, turbulence in the ocean. So what we've been doing again for, for the longest time is say, okay, well, let's try to actually you know, represent what those clouds uh, or, or you know, any processes that is happening below the grid box size will do on the large scale, right? So then all you need to know is some kind of property of the resolved flow. And so in the ocean, you can think about, oh, well, all I need to do is something about the gradients of, you know, of the tracer or the gradients of the velocity. And I'm gonna write a mathematical operator that will actually mimic what mixing and turbulence are supposed to do. It works great, uh, but nonetheless, our models are still biased, meaning that they don't reproduce accurately many properties of the climate system that we care about. And that means when we use them for projections, they will have you know, embedded errors in them. And, you know, and it's okay, you know, we, we've kind of, it's still an, a, a pretty good representation of the climate system, but can we make those simulation more accurate? So rather than start by saying, well, I know roughly what those processes are going to do on the large scale, can we actually let the data speak for itself? And that's really what we're going after. So rather than starting by a mathematical operator that will know, you know, will do something to the flow, we're gonna say, okay, let's take all the data that we have. And so, you know, we have more data than we ever had before that we can't even process for the most part. We do have high resolution simulations, we just don't have a lot of them, but we still have plenty. We have new observations uh, that are you know, coming and more coming along the way. Can we use this wealth of data with you know, the power of machine learning, which can extract information from that data set to tell us what will be you know, the effect of say turbulence on the large scale flow. So then we can go and plug it back into a climate model without making the assumption that we already know what the mathematical operator will look for. That's what my group has been doing for the last you know, several years. I'm not gonna show you the most up-to-date results uh, because we're doing a lot of stuff and I'm happy to take questions and comments at the end, but I'll show you how we actually try to not have this world of, oh, only data and machine learning versus only physics. We really try to bring the two of them together to actually make you know, the best out of uh, our understanding or, or the way we constrain the physics and what the data is teaching us. So I'm gonna show you one example uh, first, which is we're gonna take some idealized simulations of the ocean, so fairly turbulent, uh, and uh, we're gonna learn what is the missing forcing. So basically what is the missing term uh, that we would need to represent in a coarse resolution simulation. So we're gonna take a lot of data from those high resolution simulations and the input is gonna be uh, coarse resolution velocities. Then we're gonna ask a neural network, in this case, convolutional neural network. So, you know, can extract uh, something from 2D images. 
to actually again optimize for this missing force. So what is the missing closure that I would need to have in a coarse resolution model to represent the turbulence as a function of the resolved velocity? So now what we did in the architecture of that neural network is because the neural network sees images. It doesn't know physics. If you're lucky, it picks out the physics, but if you're unlucky, it just you know, picks out any features that you want. But we know that we still need to conserve some properties. And so in our case, we're focusing on momentum and that means I need to conserve momentum because I can't, you know, just have a net input uh, of momentum or a net sync of momentum when I'm going to plug that into a climate model because it's just going to drift away forever. So within the architecture, we actually embed conservation principles. And you can do that. So you're basically telling the algorithm, OK, you can't learn physics by yourself, but I'm going to impose some constraints. So that's one way to actually blend you know, physics and uh, data science together. And so we train the algorithm to learn this kind of missing forcing, so this missing parameterization of ocean turbulence that is missing uh, from a coarse resolution simulation as a function of the results in those very idealized simulations. So this is what we're asking you know, the, the parameterization to learn. So again, this is the kind of model that we use. If you're an oceanographer, you recognize it directly. It's kind of a double gyre. Uh, so we have wind blowing at the surface of the ocean, creates kind of you know, basically strong circulation on each side here. But the important bit is that you get a very strong jet in the middle. You can think about the Gulf Stream or the Coast Shield, if you're familiar. And that generates a lot of turbulence around it. And that turbulence actually feeds the jet. So it feeds the momentum, fits the ocean currents. And that's really hard to actually capture. And so we're asking the neural net to actually learn this kind of missing turbulence that is kind of represented here. So this is X and Y. So you can think about longitude and latitude here. That's the standard deviation of that forcing that we're missing. You can see it's concentrated in a jet. So it's, it's very non-uniform, right? So it's, it's a pretty tricky pattern to get, and that's just on the mean, right? So like picking that at every, you know, at every snapshot, every grid box is, is a pretty tall order. And yet they do amazing. So we basically keep, you know, 50% of the data to train, and then we test it on, you know, the, the other leftover, if you want. And so that's the mean that the neural net is predicting, and that's the standard deviation, and that's the correlation between the true forcing and what the neural net has been predicted with this kind of embedded physics. So you can see correlation is almost one everywhere, right? So just based on data, it's actually able to capture a model of the missing turbulence. So I find it pretty impressive personally. Of course, you can see regions where it does poorly, but that's actually regions where there is no turbulence. So if you go back here, right, it's all zero. So, you know, doesn't do a good job, but there's nothing to capture. So it's not the end of the world. How does that compare to say, you know, parameterization that would be based on physics for this kind of momentum closure? And this is what I'm showing here, just again, the correlation. So you can see the correlation for a, a traditional physics closure uh, where you would not necessarily learn from data, but like something that you can come up with. It's actually doing a pretty bad job. It's actually anti-correlated uh, half the time. So the neural net with its magic, to some extent, does a pretty good job. And that's, you know, that's something that teaches us that there is something in the data that just going at it with just basic assumption is not enough, that we still are missing a lot of important physics that we might be able to learn uh, directly with machine learning algorithm. Now, the downside of it is I have no idea what the neural net is doing here. I mean, it just picked out a, a great correlation, but I don't know why. And, you know, as a physicist, kind of, you know, uh, baffles me a little bit. So what we try to do is say, still, let's question the data. But rather than you know, asking kind of a black box to learn something, let's try to learn an equation for it. So machine learning has you know, many, there are many tools out there. And so one of them is you know, using what we call sparse regressions. And so that's one of the methods where we're still gonna do the same thing. You know, we're gonna diagnose the missing forcing and we're gonna ask the algorithm to learn that missing forcing, but we're gonna ask it to learn as you know, the sum of some weight, which is what we're looking for, multiplying by many basis functions. And those basis functions are taken from the data and they are equations. And so we give the algorithm, you know, velocities, gradients of velocities, gradients of temperature, and so on and so forth. And the algorithm goes and prune through that library of function and select a certain number of function that best represents this missing forcing. So now we're still using the data. We're not making an assumption about what the equation should be. We're letting the algorithm tell us what that equation should be. 
we still embedded a couple of constraints within the basis function we give it. We made them so that they can be write, written as the divergence of a flux. So again, just so, so you understand is that, so then we can actually conserve properties. And so again, you can still embed additional constraint within what you do. Now, of course, you need to make a selection a little bit, you know, how many of those basis function you want to keep and, and things like this. We kept a few that represent about 60% of the variant, which is, you know, we could have kept a, a bit more, but it was simple enough and give us, you know, some kind of beautiful equation that can be written as the divergence of a flux that is symmetric. So again, you don't need to understand any of that, but it has come a, kind of embedded properties of what we know the turbulence should look like. And we were able to actually go and explain what those terms are, what they do to the physics, uh, and the way they actually strain and steer uh, momentum. Now, if we look at the correlation, you can see that it doesn't do as good as a, as a neural net, but still, you know, as a pretty uniform correlation pretty much everywhere, meaning that kind of, you know, discovering equations can be a pretty good, you know, uh, way forward uh, in terms of using the data directly to actually learn new physics. Now, of course, can we get there with just the equation discovery? So that's something we're thinking about uh, as we move forward. So now all of that is offline. And so I showed you that from data, we can learn things. We can interpret them uh, in some instances. Sometimes we don't, but we're working on it. But that's not the final game. At the end of the day, we need to take what we learn and plug it in the course resolution model and show that it improves the simulation. And that's a very hard test uh, because it's a two-step, two, two step, basically. So now if we implement that in a, in a, in a model, so it's gonna be a very idealized model again. It's gonna still have this feature of a jet in the middle and kind of different circulation. That's what the high resolution simulation looks like. Again, it's, you know, has a jet in the middle and other circulation, but let's focus on that. That's the standard deviation of the velocity field. And so again, you know, where you have the jet, it's very turbulent. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of variability there. That's the same equation, but on a coarse grid. So same as before, right? It's, kind of less turbulent. So you can see there is less standard deviation in the flow. So it's a bit more boring. So now let's plug in our learned parameterization that we learned offline. Plug that into this kind of course resolution model and propagate the model forward in time and run it for several years. So that's what we get. If we plug in the equation discovery and if we plugged in the neural network. In both instances, it's just again, focused on the standard deviation. They both do a, a pretty good job. Overall, we had some numerical stability issues and I can talk about it forever, uh, but I'm happy to take that during questions if there are any. But overall, you know, learning from data can actually both, you know, discover new physics, new parameterization, and they can have the potential of actually improving climate simulation. So all of that is, of course, proof of concept, right? We have a long way away to understanding all the different closures and what they will do in the climate, you know, in the climate model. And, you know, as mentioned at the beginning in the intro, we're, we're very lucky uh, to have support from Schmidt Future to actually really kind of go and explore those ideas. Starting from data and blending physics and machine learning to try to learn new closures and trying to, you know, have better understanding of different climate processes in the atmosphere, like clouds and convection, in, you know, in the sea ice. Uh, so at the interaction between sea ice, ocean and atmosphere and in the ocean as well and at the interface between those different components. So then we can actually plug those new closures based on data and machine learning and implement them in community climate models that are already existing and hopefully improve our climate predictions as we move forward. And it's a big project with many, many collaborators and, and, and it's pretty exciting because we really try to leverage the huge amount of data that we're getting out there uh, to really trying to actually understand better climate processes and hopefully, uh, you know, improve climate models along the way. So I'll leave it at that. And thanks again for joining and, and for having us. And it was a pleasure to also go after Miguel, uh, where I learned a lot from. Thanks so much, Laura, for the wonderful talk. And it was so interesting because when we selected the speakers, uh, we asked the, the, each of the universities to uh, recommend speakers in the very in very broad themes, but it so happens that the talks that you gave today are such complementary <laughs> approaches, which is excellent. And I wanna thank all the audience members. I know at some places like Michigan and uh, NYU, it's already summertime and uh, maybe some people's mindset are a little bit leisurely. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, let's start um, with 
uh, questions from the audience. And just a reminder, you can put the, uh, the questions in the Q&A. Uh, first question is from George, uh, George uh, Manucharian. Is there, I think this is for Miguel, is there any non-locality in time for the eddy diffusi diffusivity closure, i.e. does the effective eddy diffusive depend only on the present state of the mean flow or also on the past? Uh, is that for me or is that for- I think so, I think it's for you. Okay. Uh... Yeah, that's a really good question. I know that there are people who have looked at non-locality in time. Uh, I haven't, one of the things that, uh, that we've done is just to look at steady velocity fields uh, and look at uh, uh, time evolution of a tracer given a steady velocity field. In that case, you have a non-locality in space, but I know people particularly here in Johns Hopkins uh, uh, that have looked at non-locality in time and they usually get something like a Caputo derivative, which is kind of like a, fraction order derivative in time as well. Uh, so that is very interesting. It, when we came into this, we were not really expect, expecting anything like that. We just happened to have a fraction order operator in, in space. I know there's probably a relationship between the two of them, but we haven't explored that. Uh, uh, so far in the steady uh, kinematic flows that we've considered, it looks like uh, non-locality in space is, the, is what we're getting uh, for all the flow cases we're, we're considering. Yeah. Next question is for Lore from Kyle Kramer. Hi, Kyle. Nice to see you in the audience. Uh, so, Laura, I think you can see the question too, yeah, right? I can see it. Yeah. So, I can really quickly, uh, uh, hopefully, the audience can see it as well. So, uh, maybe, yes. yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the audience members all can yeah. see the question. Okay. Just so uh, maybe, I'll, I'll mention yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I'll basically mention it. So Kyle is uh, discussing, and I'll share my slide again just to, uh, oh, at least, at least I think that's what we're doing. So about the correlation uh, seen between the equation discovery uh, and uh, and the neural net. So the neural net basically has very strong, you know, correlation in parts of the domain, while the equation discovery, the correlation is a little lower, but yet is actually covering a larger. Uh, extent of the basin. And so the question from Kyle is, you know, is it better, you know, to have a, you know, a decent correlation over more domain or to have a higher correlation on a smaller part of the domain? So I would say it's pretty important to have the largest possible correlation in the region where the forcing is the strongest. So where, you know, the turbulence is largest. And so we can see basically it's those kind of, you know, those regions over here, which the equation discovery gets there, but not as well as the neural net, so we're still missing something. And so I think, you know, in this case, there is a bit of a trade-off that we're missing in the turbulent region uh, by that. But of course, when we go and implement that in the climate model, then all bets are off. And that's something we definitely are testing. That's definitely a great question. It's very problem dependent as well. I think uh, the next one is also for, for you, Lor, from uh, Pedram Hassanzadi. Okay, uh, I'm wondering if it would be useful to use the equation discovery and, uh, and neural net based approach together, given that one is interpretable, the other one is more accurate. Excellent question. So right now, this is kind of our newest uh, little result is that actually within the loss function, we already basically give the neural net the equation and we ask it to learn the parameter plus a residual from it. So we feel that it might be the best approach. The more we know, the more we don't need the neural net to actually learn. Uh, you know, we can just learn the parameters. And then uh, from that, we let, we, we let it pick out the residual, which is, and then of course, you know, go and try to interpret that part. So yes, we, we're actually trying to do that together right now. Uh, but it's a tough problem. <laughs> And we, we definitely are struggling a little bit depending on the data sets that we use. Uh, it's fun, I must admit. Okay. Yeah, so let's go down, let's go down the list. I think there's some uh, questions. Next one from Karen Jakar. Sure. Uh, how do you calculate uncertainty of this, the discovered term using LVM? Um, yeah, so the equation discovery, which is relevant back to machine. So in this case, um, so it's sparse Bayesian regression. So the weights 
are assumed, are assumed to be Gaussian. And so they have an uncertainty associated with it because we already defined a Gaussian prior in the data. The, the, the uncertainty is actually pretty narrow there, to be honest. It's probably uh, you know, the fact that you know, the algorithm is pretty good at, at kind of selecting the basis function. For the neural net, in this case, we have no uncertainty, but we have a new paper that is coming out where rather than learning just the mean in the loss function, we learn the mean and the standard deviation. So that gives us an uncertainty in the missing forcing. Uh, so it's kind of another way to kind of do it with a neural net. I never know if I actually really answer the right question because there's no feedback, but I hope, uh, you know, I hope the attendees will tell me if, uh, if uh, I did not answer the question. <laughs> Okay. I think the other one is also for me, uh, Georgi. So for the coupled dynamical plus ML system, how to prevent it from, this, uh, from drifting into non-realistic phase space region, uh, i.e. regions that are not accessible for the initial high-res system? Um, that's a great question. I think that's the problem of you know, coupling a dynamical model when plus something, whether it's machine learning. I think, I think people had, had a lot of issue with our plugging in machine learning, saying that we're applying in black box and, and you know, shame on us that you know, we, we're gonna break the physics and then the model will drift. And that's true, it is possible. But I think if we manage to do that in, again, having something that first conserve properties, like we did, right? You conserve momentum and you conserve tracer and so on. So that's already the first step. So then that means you, you, know, you, you keep your conservation laws right. Now for numerical instability, that's usually built into the model itself. So you still need to you know, satisfy you know, CFL criteria and, and things like this. And so you need to have a good knowledge of, you know, of the climate model or whatever model you're gonna use. So that's why it requires both machine learning experts and dynamicists to work together because I don't think it's one or the other here. It's really a combination of expertise. I think there's one more. Uh, when you say that we now have a lot of data, you're talking about uh, data, which I assume it's observation or model output. Do we have enough oceanographic data to train your nets? Uh, and uh, could you comment a bit on the limitation or something like transfer learning? Yeah, excellent question. So I think for certain processes, we have a lot of data. I think you know to learn a subgrid parameterization, no. Uh, definitely no. Uh, and so that's why we are actually right now using transfer learning. Um, so we are training on model data and now trying to refine with uh, direct observations. And so that's definitely, there is, I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, now, if that was just to make, you know, direct prediction. So for some aspect of the climate system, you know, I mean, with some colleagues at NYU, Andrew Wilson, we've been actually trying to, you know, uh, train your net just to make sea level predictions. Uh, and Actually, you know, there's not enough in the data itself, but with transfer learning, we actually do a pretty good job. So I think, again, it will be problem dependent. For the atmosphere, there is more data. Again, for the parameterization, I don't know if that's enough, but you can use it for transfer learning for sure. I think that's definitely an important way forward. Great. Um, so, yeah, so audience members, if you have uh, questions, keep putting them in the Q&A. Uh, meanwhile, let me ask you maybe a couple of more sort of philosoph philosophical questions. Uh, I'm not a uh, oceanographer or, or an, any uh, climate researcher. Uh, researcher, I'm uh, actually uh, a brain scientist. So when you, <laughs> so when we talk about uh, sort of the, the multi-scale integration from the local level all the way to the global global level, the same question actually appears everywhere. For example, in the brain, right? You talk about within cellular, you know, cellular activities, you talk about uh, the, the, the electrical activity of each, each single cell and then the activities of the network and the brain regions. You talk about social networks, then there are, you know, individual, you know, you know individual person's behavior all the way to, you know, group behavior and then to a society's behavior. So this multi, the so-called multi-scale integration is a really, is really a buzzword today. You know, the specific mechanisms are different. The math involved are different. 
but you know, conceptually, what are some of the things that you find are interesting? And what, you know, what are some of the conversations that you guys have been having with researchers from other domains? Oh yeah, I mean, as you said, I think, I think multi-scale interaction is definitely everywhere. It doesn't really matter which field you're in. And for us, it's definitely critical, right? So if I, you know, if I wanna make a prediction of, you know, of large scale temperature, I need to know the tiny scale features. And this is a conversation we have across all different domains is how do you represent that interaction the best possible way? Is it, you know, is it random? Or can you use a bunch of random variables, you know, which could be an aspect, um, you know, well, it can work, right? Or is there more, um, you know, decision making uh, through that process? And that's that's definitely a, a that's a yeah that's a wonderful conversation, uh, you know, across field. And as you say, you know, in neuroscience, this happens all the, all the time, right? You basically, fire a neuron, but then you make a decision that has a large scale impact uh, to some extent. And so, definitely a very common very common things. Uh, that will that will remain uh, definitely in 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 our mind, since it's the driver, right? Yeah, and I, and I think for me personally, I feel like I've I've been having these type of conversations for a long time with some of my friends in mathematics about multi-scale modeling, multi-scale. Uh, just uh, there's this there's this assumption of separation of scales that we've kind of used and reused to get insight into phenomena, which is very important. But I think now we need to start looking into this regime in which you cannot assume that. And that's where you discover all of these really rich behaviors that are, I think are gonna be very interesting to see how we can gain insight into the physics of it uh, and also into the modeling and prediction of it. And it's a hard problem. That's the reason why people assume certain things before. And that's one of the things that I find most stimulating about other fields of how they try to tackle these things. Add, uh, Separation of scales, also non-linearity. Those two are just, so those are the hardest questions. So. Um, there's another, um, there's some, another question in chat uh, for Laura again, so. Okay, was equation discovered model stable as in a posterior testing or did you have to tweak it in some way to make it stable? Both machine learning models, when implemented, uh, were uh, problematic. The neural net was stable, but gave us a crazy physical behavior. Kind of, for those of you who are oceanographer, it gives basically kind of forget about the wind force and give me a gigantic eddy uh, for the size of the domain. So it was like uh, kind of crazy, uh, but never blew up nonetheless, which was, I'm still baffled by this. The equation discovery was actually unstable and we know why it's just because we're, you know, there, there were some issues with, with CFL criteria and, and I think we know now how to fix that. So we had to tune down uh, both parameterization to actually get the results we felt. And that's, yeah, that's always a problem. Um, another question just came in for Laura okay. as well. Okay, so are you able to include any additional constraint, for example, conservation of mass and momentum in the cost function of the neural net? So in this case, we didn't. We did it within the architecture itself. So we literally embedded the last layer where we're taking derivative of a tensor. And so that helped us conserve momentum. You can definitely put it in the last function. It would be a, it would be a soft constraint uh, because again, the last right, you only tend towards uh, that, you know, that minimization and doesn't necessarily enforce it and like building any of the architecture, but there are, yeah, there are several papers out there that, that do it within the loss. Uh, we, we, we embed it as well for other problems, but in this case, it was directly in the architecture. So, perfect. Looks like we're right on time. <laughs> we're one minute past. So thank you again for the wonderful talk for all the and uh, the participation from the audience members. Uh, what we're hoping for is in the next uh, school year, we'll think about ways to um, engage researchers across these seven data science institutes, think about ways to collaborate and um, hopefully some great ideas will come up. If the audience members or the speakers have thoughts on how we could effectively do this, just drop me an email. So, Again, thank you very much. Um, we'll hopefully 
see you in the future in various occasions. Thank you very much Thank you. for having us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.